Laura Bell Gray, I am so excited to have you on the show today, Laura. I met you in New York this past summer and instantly just fell in love with your sense of humor. I told everyone when I came home, I was like, Laura just makes me laugh. And that is why I love chatting with you. So thanks for joining me today on the podcast. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. And I love meeting you in New York and knew right away you were someone I needed to know and talk to on your podcast. So I'm so happy to be here. Well, Laura, you are known around the interwebs as the talking shrimp, which by the way, I laughed again uh, the other day when you said that you went to go pick up your coffee order and you said, oh, I ordered this on the internet and felt (laughs) really old (laughs) instead of saying I ordered it online. (laughs) Yes. In fact, it was worse. I said, you know, hi, I'm here to pick up my bagel. I, I ordered it over the internet. It wasn't just on the internet, but over the internet, which was somehow worse. And then I, they handed it to me and I ran out. I hope, I hope never to be seen again. I hope they don't recognize me next time. I'm going to go in with like uh, glasses and a mustache. I am dead. Okay. I have to tell you <laughs> that, okay, listeners, you know, we normally dive right into it, which I promise you we will in just a minute, but I just have to say this thing. You will feel better if you watch, do you know the comedian Nate Bargatze? Bargatze, I think is how you say his name. Okay. So he has three different Netflix specials. He's my favorite comedian in the world because it's all, well, first of all, it's all clean humor, which is really hard for a lot of comedians, I think, to be funny when they can't use like any, you know, expletives or or anything like that. So anyways, he tells us one story where he goes into Starbucks and he gets so embarrassed because the barista like can't understand his order. And it just reminds me of like, it's like the way he worded it. And it reminds me of your little, your little situation. So I <laughs> highly recommend you go watch that clip on YouTube somewhere. You will laugh your butt off. <laughs> I will. And console myself. Thank yes. you. <laughs> okay. So Laura, like I said, you're known around the interwebs as the talking shrimp, but you were not always the talking shrimp. Can you tell us your employee to entrepreneur story? What made you finally take that leap from cubicle to CEO, if you ever worked in a cubicle? <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, first, I'm going to do a little correction. This isn't your fault, but it's talking shrimp and not the talking shrimp because I <laughs> because I don't like to seem like I'm the mascot of my business. <laughs> Um, it's just the thing when, when everyone's like, you're the talking shrimp. I'm like, no, I'm the face of talking shrimp. It's a small, it's a tiny distinction. Not your fault. Everyone's like, you know, so we've got the talking shrimp here. So anyway, it's my fault. Thank, no, thank you for that distinction. That actually is important, <laughs> but continue. <laughs> I think so too. Like people expect me to be in a giant shrimp costume. Uh, So I was never a cubicle kind of person. I lasted six months in my one true nine to five cubicle job. And that was at age uh, 24. And I just, I could not hack it. Um, You know, I couldn't get to, you were, you were expected to get to work by 10. I couldn't hack that. And then by nine for summer hours, and my, my boss kept saying, Laura, do you want summer hours? Cause you're not going to get them uh, at this rate. And I was like given detention and had to stay till six when everybody else cut out at three. Anyway, the job that I had for most of my 20s and 30s, um, half my 20s and into my 30s, was in TV promos. And yes, I went to an office. Uh, I was permalance, so I got benefits and, um, you know, but wasn't on payroll. And I, I got some benefits, wasn't on payroll, et cetera. I got to come and go as I pleased. And it was a dream job. So I, I was writing promos. For TV, which if you don't know what promos are, there are those spots that you see that say, you know, premiering soon, the new White Lotus. And you see that it's not even voiceover like that anymore. But um, the spots that tell you to watch the show that's coming up or coming up next. And so I did that for TV Land and Nick at Night. And it was a wonderful job. I always wanted to work in TV. I wanted to write in some way, but didn't know what until I heard about promos, like writing the short things that go in between the shows. And I was there for many years, but I kind of kept getting fired or let out of my contracts because let go from my contracts or they would be terminated because I could not toe the line. I couldn't do corporate life. They said eventually, like, it's kind of bad for morale that you come in at 
you know, 1 p.m. I mean, you're allowed to, but people talk. And I got a lot of must be nice from people around me. And uh, eventually, and I kept doing that work after I um, started acting as an independent contractor, but also segued into the online world, which was kind of by accident. I made this friend in hip hop class at Crunch. And, um, you know, perky, bouncy, incredible dancer, adorable, always like to have fun, always looking like perfect in her cute hip hop outfit, always in the front row, et cetera. Hated her at first. And then I started talking to her one day and she turned out to be really nice and had great energy. And I was like, oh no, now I have to like her. Her name was Marie Forleo. And She at the time was a life coach and um, she was a life coach and a bartender and getting into dance, et cetera. And I kind of felt bad for her. I was like, that's a tough life. Um, She started like she's she was working so many jobs like she works really hard and she started teaching hip hop class at crunch because she was that good and I started going to her classes and we became really good friends. And um, at the beginning of every class, she would she would open the class by saying, I'm not just a hip hop teacher. I'm also a life coach and I have a free newsletter. And if you sign your name and email on this legal yellow pad that I pass around at the end of the class, um, you can get on it and people have a free newsletter. And people, So she was building a list right there, analog style from the very beginning. So we became good friends and she knew what I did for work, you know, I, that I was a copywriter in TV and she invited me to speak at her first live event, which was called Rich, Happy and Hot Live. It was like, you know, 50 people in the library of the Soho house. And I did a talk on copywriting. It was called Five Secrets to non Sucky Copy. And people started coming up to me at the end of that talk and saying, you know, I'm a realtor. I need help with my website. Can you help me? I'm a this. I need some help with my copy. Can you help me? And I hadn't done any kind of um, you know, online, like website copywriting before, but I knew that I would be good at it or better at it than most people. Cause most people don't know how to write like a human. So I took on some jobs here and there and eventually ended up segueing entirely into the online world. That's weird world that we're both in of solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, breastfeeding preneurs, every kind of preneur (laughs) that you can imagine Uh, (laughs) and um, made a business of private clients. Uh, And that was really great work for a long time. And I kept raising my rates. Um, I went from like 250, like $250 an hour to 500 an hour to 750 an hour to 950 an hour. Uh, And then I started getting tired of private clients, not because I didn't like the work we did together. I really liked them. Um, And I really enjoyed the work when we were in it. I would do it in real time, like in a Google Doc over the phone or Zoom, Skype back then. And um, the thing is, I hated seeing these appointments on my calendar. Like I thought, you know, what if I cleared Mondays and Fridays? off of my, like no clients on Mondays and Fridays. I'm going to try it just Wednesdays, Thursday, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. I would take clients. And then I loved that so much. I loved my Wednesday, my Mondays and Fridays so much. I was like, what if I took Wednesdays and Thursdays, oh, sorry, Tuesdays and Thursdays off the table and had took clients only on Wednesdays. And I did that and I was like, oh, what freedom. And then Wednesday would come around and I'd be like, oh no, it's Wednesday. And so what I wanted really was to be writing for myself in my voice. And I kind of fantasized like, if only I could get paid to just write my emails, because I love doing that. I loved writing my emails and blog posts and that kind of stuff. And that's where I felt like I was in the zone and really, you know, living my purpose, as they say. Um, And at the same time as that, I was also starting to feel like I don't want to be known as 
like, I'm tired of being known as so-and-so's copywriter, or, you know, this is Laura. She writes for even like Fandango and she writes for Bravo, or this is Laura. She writes for Marie Forleo. Um, all of those things were great luxury problem, but I felt like I don't want to be anyone known as so-and-so's copywriter or anyone's anything. I want to be known as Laura freaking Belgray. That was it. I wanted to be introduced as, you know, this is Laura freaking Belgray. She's a writer. And so that kind of dovetailed with my urge to write in my own voice, write my own stuff for a living. I wasn't really sure how, but I was sort of on my way, um, even though I didn't offer my own courses yet, except for my mini course. I had a couple of mini courses that I sold through my emails. I did have experience selling courses as an affiliate and making pretty good money from them. My first taste of it was with Marie Forleo's program, B-School. And I had been doing that for a few years. And each year I got a little better at it and was like, holy crap, this is a $2,000 program and I get $1,000 for each one I sell. So I remember the first time that I sold 20, what a business this is. I need to do more of this. And so I would just ramp it up every year um, with B-School. It didn't occur to me for a while to take on other courses, other affiliate programs uh, until a couple of people asked me. So they would start to see me on the leaderboard for B-School. And when people see you on the leaderboard, they say, hey, will you be an affiliate for my program? And I was like, well, I've previously only promoted B-School, but I guess I could try yours too. Um, I can no longer say this is the only program I ever promote, but that was fine. And I found like, this is, this is really something. This is a way to make some money. And of course, I added in my own programs, um, my own courses eventually, and I had the copy cure with Marie. And uh, all together, that combined by 2019, um, which was when I turned 50, I had my first million dollar year. And that was really exciting for me, like a huge milestone. And I consider myself a late bloomer, but I also know that that's a number that most people in the world never hit in a lifetime. So very lucky in that sense. I'm not a late bloomer at all. Just super fortunate. I love that attitude and and perspective of just realizing that we're all on our own timelines. And like you said, what you have accomplished is something that many people never get to experience. So how how lucky are we, right? Like we're the lucky ones. Yes. And um, I, I am so excited to dive into today's case study with you because you are brilliant at selling with your words, selling for just being you and and people trust what you have to say and they and they relate to the stories that you share. So we're going to look at in particular the six figure affiliate launch. And when I say six figures, I I mean for the listener, six figures that Laura earned in affiliate commissions from a launch that she supported with our mutual friend Selena Sue, which is how actually how uh, Laura and I met. So this was for Selena's program, Impacting Millions. And at the time when you made six figures from this launch, you only had a 6,000 person email list. Now I realize I'm going to put a huge asterisk next to the word only (laughs) because I know for many people, 6,000 feels like holy crap, like I've made it. Like this is a huge list. So I I realize it's subjective. I only say only in relation to Laura's own list at this point. So I would first love just to set the scene for our listeners. At this point in your business, where did these 6,000 subscribers come from? Were these your mostly your clients? Were these people who signed up for a newsletter, students? Like where where did these people come from? Yeah. And and also, I I appreciate your asterisk. Um, This is still not just relative to my list now but relative to the lists of many of my peers, most of them, uh, people that have been in business the same amount of time as me, who have lists of, you know, 100,000, 200,000, a million people. And um, still, I have a relatively weenie list. In fact, when I show it on a slide, I show a cocktail wiener next to like above a kielbasa. Um, 
<laughs> that's pretty much the size of it. And so that those 6,000 people, some of them came from me just putting up my opt-in, which was like from the very beginning, Marie, I was very lucky to have her in my life because she told me your list is gold. What are, what are you going to have on your site for an opt-in? When I was making my first site and it's like my what in, and she's like, you got to have an opt-in and it shouldn't just be sign up for my newsletter. It should have a freebie, a lead magnet, some kind of goodie that they can, um, I think she, in B-School, she and her partner then, Laura Roder, used to call it your big banana. So I turned that talk that I had given for her into an opt-in, into a, a lead magnet called Five Secrets to non Sucky Copy. So a lot of people signed up for that. And back then there was a lot less noise, a lot less you know, competition. So people would say like, ooh, that sounds good. I'll take it. And it was pretty easy to get. Um, opt-in still my list grew pretty slowly because I am an ads phobe and never jumped on the ads train back when I should have I, I would hear people say it is like putting a quarter into a machine and getting out four dollars or something it's like wow that sounds great I'm still scared of it and I didn't do it so a lot of my leads I was very lucky to get from oh you know what a lot of them came from before the copy cure even came out from Marie putting my testimonial on her site and then also mentioning me in the resources for B-School. So it wasn't there for all to see, but once you are in B-School, you might see my name uh, as a good copywriter and sign up through there. So I think that drove a lot of traffic to my site. And you know, what's funny is when Marie first asked me to give her a testimonial back in the day for her life coaching site, uh, I balked. I was like, ah, I would love to as a friend, but I just don't feel comfortable with all these people. Like if people in my professional world see it on this life coaching site, they might think it's cheesy or something and it might not be good for my reputation. She's like, totally get it. That's just fine. And then later on down the road, I was like, oh, that's just silly of me. I mean, who's going to see it anyway? And <laughs> little did you know. <laughs> little did I know. And little did I know like how incredibly powerful that would be for driving traffic. So a lot of them came from, I, I would say most of them probably came from B-School and from Marie's site. Um, and giving testimonials is a great way to get traffic to your site. People look you up when they see your name on someone's someone else's program or site or anything like that. So that's that's the answer to that. I was just going to say, what a cool visibility hack. Uh, I don't think this has ever come up in a podcast conversation, but now that you're saying it, I actually can totally relate to that because I am a testimonial for my friend Haley Burkhead's program. And I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a DM randomly from someone being like, hey, um, I came across your page because I saw your face and your story presented for this program. I'm thinking about joining. So I thought I would check out your profile and what you're up to. And now I have XYZ question. And that is so interesting. Okay. So everybody listening, this is, this is a sign that if you are part of a program and you have had some success with it, even if you haven't been reached out to by the program creator. I know that as fellow program creators, we always, always love getting testimonials from our students. So don't be afraid to reach out and say, hey, I actually had great success with you know your course or your program, and I would love to um, you know volunteer my story as a testimonial if you'd be interested in sharing it on your sales page or maybe in your emails. And like Laura said, even if they're not linking back to your website or your social channels per se, people are curious and they're going to likely Google you to A, make sure you actually exist as a real person and not you're not just like a stock image that they slapped on the website, right? And and so you never know where that could lead. That's brilliant. I love that tip. Um, it's true. And what I just want to jump in and say, we don't just like it or love it. We live for it. When you reach out and say, um, loved your course so much, I got X result. Like, thanks to your course, I did X, Y, and Z, or just love it. Especially if you reach out with results, we live for it. It's such a win-win because you, people will come seek you out and maybe end up on your list. So smart. Now you were up against some big players in this launch, like you mentioned, uh, but you ended up number one on the leaderboard with a 6,000 person email list. And need I remind you again, six figures in affiliate earnings. So 
I have to know because typically speaking, if for those of you listening who maybe haven't participated in an affiliate launch before, which basically just means you're promoting someone else's offer, program, or service um, to your own audience, and then you typically will earn a commission percentage for each product or offer that you sell on their behalf. And typically speaking, as an affiliate, you get uh, a swipe copy, right? You like the whoever the creator of the program is, they'll send you maybe a document with some pre-written emails or or social media posts that make your life easier to promote whatever it is that they're selling. However, and I, I have a feeling I know the answer to this for you, <laughs> but I would just love for you to kind of share your process. Do you even look at the swipe copy? Do you use any piece of it? What is your approach to actually writing the emails that go out to sell a certain yeah. product or service? Yeah. When, when I want to kill it, with an affiliate launch, which I normally do. Sometimes I'll be lazy and I'll be like, sure, I'll do a light mailing, um, fine. And I will look at, the, maybe look at the swipe to see what they have there. I'll always open it and look at it to see what they're suggesting or if there's a framework that I can use, but I usually ditch it. And the only part I ever <clears throat> use verbatim copy paste in any way might be their bullet points um, like say for a webinar, but usually I end up changing those too and giving them a little my own flavor because I usually end up sounding a little salesy. Mm -hmm. Or if I am going to copy paste it, I will often say, here are the bullet points copy pasted from so-and-so, you know, copy pasted right from Selena's own email. Um, I stole it so that they know it's her words and not mine. It gives it that framework so there's not like a disconnect. Even that piece you saying like, hey, in Selena's own words, I stole this piece. Like even that is adding your flavor, right? Like your unique personality. Not a lot of people are going to be like, I stole this piece of coffee. You know, most people right. are just going to be like, all right. And now here is the the response from so-and-so. Um, so I, I even just in that one little glimpse, I, I kind of start to see your your magic at play. What are some other ways that you infuse your voice and personality into these emails that you think make you perform so well as an affiliate partner? Like, is do you follow it? For example, like, do you follow a certain story structure over the week or two that you're promoting during open cart? Uh, do you always like have a specific email that's like testimonial driven versus something else? Like, give us a behind the scenes into your brain. Like, how do you approach the strategy of these emails? Yeah. So again, if I'm going all in on a launch, I am going to promote every chance I get, like from the very beginning of the pre-launch when they for are first maybe teasing it um, till they have some kind of pre-launch content, free content it might be those three videos, or it might be a webinar, it might be all of those things. Um, and then through to open cart all the way through, like every time they dangle a new thing, I will email for it. And so I always start in these cases with like pretty early on by teasing it, maybe even before they have announced it or offered any kind of pre-launch content, um, say it's Selena. And I know usually I'll start with like, she would start giving stuff way in advance, like her publicity calendar. So, so say with Selena, I will start by, um, introducing her to my audience through in an email and talking about my connection to her. Now you won't always have this. You might not have a personal connection. You might not be personal friends with the person you're an affiliate for, but if you are, it is nice to show that connection, get people to like them. Um, and you know, they're going to trust them more if they can't like, Oh, it's a friend of Ellen's. Um, so like with Selena, I would, st I would start off by telling a story. I think the subject line was my um, very shy friend took a bold leap or something like that. And it was a story that introduced her and talked about how shy she was when we first met and the kind of awkward dinner that we had together, but how she like would take down a whole plate of burrata and then take home the leftovers. I was like, girlfriend could eat. Um, and that made me like her right away. And I, I kind of thought she didn't like me because she was so shy. 
And then it turned out that she, you know, then she followed up with an invitation to like, here's some other places that we could go. And here, like it was a um, totally hyperlinked email, like here's the place I mentioned and et cetera, et cetera. So I told that whole story and then talked about how she first got publicity. I think I forget what that story was, but it was a way of both introducing her. So giving them a connection to her and showing a, if she can do it, so can you kind of story. Now, if I didn't, um, if I wasn't really friends with Selena and didn't have that whole story to tell, I might start by talking about just about publicity and what it has done for me. Like you might have noticed, and this was one of my emails, I think it's probably the next one in there um, talking about, you might've noticed in the past couple of years, if you've been around that I've been in like, you know, Business Insider, Forbes, and on a bunch of podcasts, and maybe speaking on a stage or two. And um, it's done such great things for my business, and therefore for my life, and my income, and I'm really into it. And the reason I got started with this is because of my friend, Selena Sue. And so another way to mention her. But so this is all my way of saying how one way that I put my per my personality and my unique spin on this, on all of this is by telling my stories and my connection to the thing that I'm promoting. Um, and I, I don't think I have taken on promoting anything that I don't have some connection to some experience with that I, where I can't say, you know, this is a great thing I know because I've used it too. Sometimes, sometimes it's not the exact course. I, I'm not going to lie and say like, I learned everything I know from this course. I'll say what she teaches in this course um, is something so valuable that it's done this for me. I love So I tell stories. So go ahead. Oh, I, yeah. I was just going to echo what you said that I, I love the way you use stories to create those points of connection. And uh, to your point, it doesn't feel salesy because – humans love stories. Like we all want to know more about our favorite people, right? And so I, I didn't even know about that story of you and Selena going to dinner, but that it's <laughs> funny because she is such a foodie and it's so like her to be really thorough and send you a follow-up email with <laughs> future restaurants to visit Hyperlink. That's so funny. Um, I, I really like that example that you gave of how you would approach this if you do have a personal connection with someone versus if you do not. So I hope that those of you listening can take that into account if you're thinking of doing an affiliate launch, how to precede that connection before the cart even opens. Now, during the actual enrollment window, when people can actively purchase, you kind of already alluded to uh, you know, the cadence of the frequency in which you're emailing people basically every chance you get to talk about this. Is that typically one time a day during open car? And then do you ramp up the frequency in the last 48 hours, 24 hours? Talk to us a little bit about the the volume, I guess, throughout the week of enrollment. Yes. Okay. Wait, I want to put a pin in that for one second. I hope this isn't frustrating for you, but I want to add one more thing that I do in the pre-launch. If I don't if I really don't have a connection to the course at all um, or to the thing that it's teaching, and in fact, it would not be, you would not associate me with it. And you'd be like, really? Laura's promoting this thing? It's something that so doesn't match your brand. Um, one thing that I did for Denise Duffield Thomas's Money Bootcamp, where I was also the number one affiliate, this was back in 2017, um, was I started with a, an email that said, don't tell my husband. And I, and it was a story about how I have to hide my somewhat woo side. I now refer to it as woo adjacent side from my husband because he's such a skeptic and he like really looks at me like ascons. If I even mention any, if I say the universe, he's like, what happened to you? <laughs> um, so, so it was a whole story about how I was like dipping my toe into what Denise taught about money mindset because I would. Do, did want to change my relationship with money. And she brings in some kind of some stuff that I would not want my husband in the room for like tapping EFT, you know, emotional freedom technique. And so the whole email was about doing that stuff in secret and just giving it a shot because why not? Like, and should you do it too? Sure. Like if you have this problem, this problem, you know, if you wish you could change this, this, and this like me, let's do it together. Sure. Okay. So Back to your question about frequency once the cart opens and whether I ramp up. So I, first of all, the before the cart opens, 
I will be gathering an interest list um, during that seeding period, um, telling people if you're super interested in this, you know, make sure and click here so I know, so I can keep you in the loop about any bonuses. So I will email the day before, I'll say, heads up, I'm going to be sending out this link. You know, the car, the, the doors are opening tomorrow and I'm going to be sending out the link um, probably by 10 a.m., whatever time. And uh, if you know you want in, be ready to pounce because I'm going to have these special bonuses and one of them is might be limited like to the first 50 people or the first five people, whatever it is. So I will send, um, I'll send that. And then when cart opens, I, you know, send one, it's here. Um, I usually only send one on one a day, not more than one a day until sometimes the, like, I'd say the day before cart close. Uh, and sometimes I don't send one every single day if it's a really long open cart period, especially now when I'm looking to like preserve, I don't want to burn my list and there are more and more affiliate launches and I promote a lot of things. So I don't, you know, I don't want to ram it down their throats, even though I will say the more emails you send, the more sales you're going to make no matter what. So I try to balance it out. Um, so I don't always email every day. If it's a, like a two week open cart or a two and a half week open cart, I just cannot do that. I'll email on my normal schedule and pretty much every email that I send to my list, uh, except for those who opt out, who do a soft opt out, um, will get, you know, all those emails will be about the thing that I am promoting. Okay, Laura, you ready for a lightning round? I guess I am. <laughs> All right, three quick questions coming your way. Question number one, I had to ask you this because one of the things that is most memorable about our first meeting is that you told me you hate the word journey, and now I can never write that word without thinking of you. So I had to ask you, what do you think besides journey is the most overused word in sales copy that you would be happy to never see touch an email again? <laughs> Oh, besides journey, I mean, empowerment and empowered mm. is, yeah, empowered is, has always been um, something that a pet peeve of mine. And I'm trying to think what else right now in sales copy, not necessarily, but in the marketing world, vulnerable. Ooh. Okay. So it's overused. Buzzwords. Yeah. I get you. It's buzzwords. And I, I'm all down with vulnerability. I prefer to refer to it as flossom, being flossom, embracing your flaws, putting them out there. Just because people are so, uh, people are so full of what I would call vulnerable shit or vulnerability, where they're just like, "This is going to be my most vulnerable post ever." I'm, I have to confess to you. I have a big confession, and that is that I'm feeling really less than about my seven figure launch. Um, the seven figures came in in an hour and I just don't feel worthy. <laughs> and that my friends is what we call sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that, that is very true. I will say, yes, people, if you're going to be vulnerable, it's almost like you don't really have to announce it. You can just say what it is that, mm -hmm. that, that you feel you need yes. to say, right? Yes. Great answer. Question number two, what is your least favorite chore? <laughs> I hate all chores. <laughs> anything, <laughs> anything that involves cleaning. And you can ask my husband um, that I'm even reluctant to lift my feet when the vacuum comes by. Are you the same person? <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, why am I always cleaning up after you? I'm like, because I cannot clean up things. I hate cleaning up, but also paperwork. Mm. Paperwork is in, in my life, the thing that I, no one can do for me. Mm. I hate any paperwork. I don't like admin in general, but if it's printed out on paper, like if it comes in an envelope and I'm supposed to fill it out with a pen, it is going to be used as a coaster for three years. So I imagine election ballots are, are hard then. <laughs> Oh my God. It's like, it's good that I have to just go to the place and in oh, order to get out of the place, yeah. I have to fill them in. But if you, if it's a proxy, ballot, you know, if it's an absentee ballot that's sitting on my desk, forget it. I'm not voting. So that's why I go vote. Again, it's good to know who you are and, and what you will and will stand for, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Final question. Um, I, I went back and forth. There was like two I wanted to ask you 
But I'm going to go with this 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 second one because you know you're you're a word a wordsmith. So what uh-uh. uh, what what not to throw <laughs> on you, but what would be your self chosen superlative? Oh, like if they were voting for me, I would hope it would be in in high school. Yeah, I, I I would hope it would be funniest. I think I think you've you've lived up to that that dream. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not going to be neatest or most organized. Um, none of those things or uh, even most likely to succeed, even though I ha- always want to succeed, but that, that wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have been voted that. So I'm going to go with funniest. Great. That's pretty accurate. I would say spot on. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> so real quick, uh, two definitions. What is a soft opt out? for those listening. And then also when you say, if it is a longer open cart, like you mentioned, maybe two, two and a half weeks, and you don't do the daily cadence, uh, you said, then I'll email on my regular schedule. What is your regular schedule? Yeah. Okay. So I'll start with the soft opt out. So as these emails ramp up, and especially once I, once the cart is opened and I'm no longer just um, pushing them to free stuff that everyone should be happy to get and not complain about, Uh, I start putting in, usually in the top of my email, sometimes at first it's at the the bottom. And as I feel like people might start to get annoyed who aren't interested, start putting it at the top, um, a little box of text. I like to put it in a different color, um, like a different color background from the rest of it. It's just kind of like a warning box, a heads up. Um, You know, this email is about, say, impacting millions. Um, and I might say the card is now open and have a link to go there. If you don't want to hear about it, uh, but want to stay on my list, don't worry, I've got you. And then I'll have a link that says, no, don't send me any more emails about impacting millions. Thanks. Um, and so then when they click that, they go to, it sends them to a page that says, you know, I got you. Don't worry. You're off the ride. And, it's a great way to save yourself from unsubscribes um, because people who, you know, they're like, oh, I do want to stay on your list. I just don't want to get these anymore. So it gives them a chance to do that. And one thing to note, one thing that I have changed over the years is um, I used to say, like, don't want to get these emails, you know, click the link. And um, then the link, you know, will say, um, stop sending me, you know, it, it might say stop sending me emails um, about Selena Sue or whatever, but it's not as obvious that it's a don't click here unless. Um, so sometimes, so now I put I put it in a very obvious negative um, wording so that people aren't tempted to click because you know how tempted we are to click something without even reading it. So I would I used to get a lot of emails back saying, oh no, I accidentally unsubscribed from the emails. So I make it very clear. And sometimes I'll even add an arrow after it saying, don't click till you've read it. Smart. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Warning. (laughs) So yes, warning. Um, Because people really love to click things. It's a, it's a good problem to have, but so that's a soft opt out. And then what is my regular schedule? So my regular schedule uh, is Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And then my, um, my welcome sequence usually goes out on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays. So those people get a blend of, you know, they might end up getting an email every day for a while, but, um, yeah, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays is my regular emailing schedule, which I ramped up from the, the original was just Wednesdays. And, um, there's a fun, little tip that I got from Ron Reich, who we both know. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was my coach for a little while. And he, um, he told me, I told him, like, I would be so happy if everyone who got who got on my list, everyone who was on my list actually bought one of my mini products that I sell from my emails. And he was like, well, I have a solution for you. If you want to sell more from your emails. You want to send more emails. The more emails you send, the more sales you will make. So I recommend doing, instead of just Wednesdays, emailing on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Mondays and Wednesdays will be the quote unquote pure value emails. And then Fridays will be the pure sell 
Um, so I tried that in moderation because I'm never going to write an email that's just a pure sell. It's always going to have some kind of fun to it, some storytelling. But uh, I did that. And within a month, I saw my sales double for the products that I sell, my mini products in, the, in those emails. So that's why I ramped it up to Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And you get more unsubscribes, but you get more sales. That's awesome. And that, I mean, in all fairness, that's a good trade-off that most people would take, right? Yes. We'll take the more yeah. sales over the subscribers who just sit and do nothing. So exactly. that's a great distinction. All right. So we talked about the pre-launch window, the open cart window, and then you did mention typically in the last 24 to 48 hours, you will ramp up frequency at that point. What does that look like? Are you someone who sends like a 12 hours to go, six hours to go, one hour to go, one minute to go, or, or what does that look like for you? I am. I am that person. Um, and I was squeamish about it at first, but I, I think I experienced actually back when I was selling B-School that the more emails I sent on that last day, the more sales I would make. And people would write back and say, I wasn't going to buy, but you got me with this one email. Mm. And I realized then, I was like, you never know which one email is going to get that one person to buy your thing. And especially when you're dealing with like a thousand dollar commission, um, it's like, do I want to, you know, write an email for a thousand dollars? Sure. And usually it's more than that. I mean, if one person, it depends how big your list is, but if that one person is going to be off the fence because of that one email, then probably more are too. So, um, and it's a, one of those things where you just kind of hit them from different angles, like different selling points. One's maybe more emotional, one's, um, more numbers driven. One is more proof driven, like, well, I need proof. You know, everyone needs something a little different, especially on that last day, the ones who've been waiting, um, waiting till the very last second to buy. So yeah, I am that person. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, it's interesting, even with our own internal sales, I would say almost without fail, the last 24 hours, more than 50% of our sales come in those last 24 hours. So it, it can be a long ride before then <laughs> where you're like, does anybody hear this? But then on the last day, people people take action. Um, and I guess we're just all inherent procrastinators, which is totally <laughs> totally who I am too. Um, let's talk about bonuses for a moment. You you briefly mentioned this already that you you know sometimes you'll do a bonus for the first fifty people or or you know the early bird bonus. Do you always create your own bonus for any affiliate launch you do? And specifically for going back to this one case study with impacting millions when you made that six figures. Did you add your own bonus for that launch? And if so, what was it? And how did you decide what was the right bonus to complement, you know, whatever it was that you're that you were promoting? Yeah, um, I had multiple bonuses for it. I I do almost always like and always when I'm feeling, you know, I want to do really well with this. I think I could make a lot from this and feeling competitive. Um, I add in my own bonuses. Once in a while, I'll be lazy and say, you know, what? I'm not going to do any bonuses for this. I'm just going to see what happens. We email a little bit and see what happens. Um, and often <laughs> the affiliate manager will say to me, you're doing so awesome. Imagine if you added in a bonus. I'm like, oh, fine, I'll add in a bonus. I'm just... You know, it's just me being lazy when I don't. Um, and especially when the commission is high, like for Selena's, it was $1,500. That's the highest commission that I know of for any program. Very generous. And so it was worth it to me to offer um, a limited number of one-on-ones, which I don't offer anymore at all, For you can't buy them. So that's a big prize. And that would be you know, right out of the gate, the limited bonus, like, you know, if this is going to the first five people or whatever it is who sign up today, or sometimes it might be um, a drawing in that, you know, sign up by the end of the day and you have a chance of winning one of these one-on-ones. Um, I've done it both ways. I think, you know, people are more inclined to sign up, to give it a shot. Um, because like right out of the gate, they think, okay, I've probably missed out on this. So I'll just wait. Um, so I, I do like the idea of, you know, saying you've got all day to be eligible 
for this bonus and maybe you'll win it. That's smart. Then they're thrilled if they do. Yeah. Um, so that was one of the bonuses. Uh, I did calls with like Selena was very supportive. Not everyone does this, but you know, we, um, combined forces and put on a mastermind called the Shrimp Acting Millions Mastermind. And um, we've done, we did it like three or four years in a row. It was great. And um, originally it was in her apartment in New York City and which could only comfortably seat like 12 people. So we would say there are 12 spots. And usually that was kind of a mic drop bonus that I would offer toward the end. Um, I've also offered a like unlimited at the end, like everybody gets in on this, a media mixer where um, to, you know, complement the program where I bring in like my cool podcaster friends. Um, yeah, I think they were mostly all podcasters talking about what wins them over in a pitch or something, or what's the, you know, the one tip they give to be like being on their podcast. And um we were originally going to do, I think the first time I offered that was in, was it in, yeah, in 2020, thinking like, oh, by fall of 2020, we'll, we'll do it in person. Um, and of course, that didn't come to pass. So we did it virtually. And, you know, I continued to offer that. Um, and then, the, like, I think this year, I just offered the recording of it instead of doing it again. I got a little lazier with the bonuses. Um and I might have done an email makeover jam or two. Um, I like doing those. And I think we did a, originally it was called the Get in Forbes workshop. Then it was, it became more of a Get in the Media workshop where um, Selena and Linnea would, her head media coach would workshop their pitches. So there were a lot of these like, oh my gosh, I've, I'm signing up just for that kind of bonuses. So many creative ideas. I hope you all were taking down some notes and, and you can see how there's so many ways you could go about this. You can sell, uh, not sell, rather add, I should say, pre-recorded content. You can team up with maybe the creator of the program if they're willing to create something special. You can offer something that maybe you don't normally sell like Laura does with her one-on-one -on -one spots. Um, I wanted to add to this just for a little bit of context for the listeners. If you've never heard of Impacting Millions, this was Selena's signature program that would help you get media features, right? And and so, for example, like when we partnered with her for the launch and you're thinking through your bonuses about what could amplify or, or help someone purchasing this program have a quicker route to success, right? So like what we did, I think was um, one of our bonuses was I hired a writer who used to be the editor of Cosmopolitan South Africa, and she wrote an article um all about making the leap from employee to entrepreneur. And anybody who purchased the program under our referral link got a guaranteed feature in this roundup style article. And so wow. it was, it was a, an easy sell for the people wanting to buy because, you know, like I, I, I think I even said this in my email, email, an object in motion stays in motion. So once you get your first media feature under your wing, it's so much easier to go out and get the second, third, fourth, fifth one. So I thought, hey, let's make it a guarantee you're going to get a media feature when you join this program and then let's keep the momentum rolling. So I just wanted to add that extra little bit of context when you guys are thinking about how can I utilize what Laura's sharing here to create really juicy bonuses that help my referrals succeed. All right, Laura, my last two questions for you around this case study. So first, I, I, I guess for people listening who have either never participated as an affiliate partner for someone, or maybe they're thinking of doing more, I'm sure you get so many requests these days of people wanting you to be an affiliate partner for them. How do you select which ones you choose to show up for? Is there a list of criteria that you mentally run through? Are there any questions that you'll ask a, a potential um partner before you will consider doing it. Walk us through your kind of filter process for that. Yeah, it's usually a, hmm, yeah, that sounds good. Sure. If I think that they have a great machine in place, um, potentially, or there's little competition and they don't have a ton of big uh, affiliates already. Cause when they, you know, when you're up against 
like the world. If somebody has like a, a thousand affiliates, which Marie used to have, she used to have so many affiliates. It became a little bit of a drag because you were part of a lot of noise and it was a small universe of people. It's like people would be like, oh great, it's B-school season. Um, here's more, like I just got 10 today. Can you leave me alone, please? Um, so yeah, not too, like if it's kind of newish and not too many affiliates, that's a great opportunity to join in. Um, if the commission is generous, um, if they have really great pre-launch content, really great free content that's easy to drive people to, um, that's, that is a winner. I'm trying to think of it, like things that where I'm like, meh, um, usually like, a paid boot camp, I'm not so excited about. I've been an affiliate for paid boot camps, and um, which led to something, you know, bigger. And I don't know, maybe it felt off brand um, to my people because I, I don't think it went over that well. Mm. Um, if somebody is like energetically so different from me, like the where people would be like, really, you're promoting this person? Um, that doesn't feel like you then, you know, cause I have said yes to one or two of those and it just doesn't, it, it might be somebody I like very much and yet their brand is like, makes me feel a little like me. Um, that, that's how my people will feel too. So, and, and it, the results show it. Right. Like I do not make a lot from those launches. So um, that's one that I'll say no to or do a really light mailing for mm -hmm. like, and, and I won't be that, I won't be super over the top persuasive about it. I'll just be like, this could, you know, um, say it's somebody teaching you how to self publish. Uh, I might say, you know, this is a great route to take. If you don't want to go through, like, trust me, publishing, you know, getting published is, it takes a lot of work and a lot of time. And if you want your book out there, you want to get self-published. And I happen to have somebody, you know, know somebody or have a friend who has um, a program for you. This might be a fit for you. So I won't be like, this person is, you know, the greatest ever, perfect for you. Their program is the best hands down. I'll just kind of suggest it. Here's an option for you. So many great takeaways. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So my three biggest ones were if there's an offer that could potentially help a certain part of your audience, but isn't quite enough for you to jump all in on for an affiliate launch. Maybe you relate it to something going on in your own life. Like you said, Laura, when you're you know in the process of writing and debuting your book, which we can talk about in just a moment. Um, that's a great attachment opportunity to suggest, like you said, in a kind of like a one-off way. Another big takeaway from what Laura just said uh, is making sure there's audience alignment because if it doesn't feel authentic to you, it's not going to feel authentic to your people either. And then the third takeaway that I had uh, was for me, now I'm thinking this through as someone who is on both sides of the coin, right? I, I will be an affiliate part. Well, not so much anymore, but like in the past, I would be an affiliate partner for people. But now thinking of how can I recruit rock star affiliates, people of your caliber, that pre launch content, knowing how important it is to you and to helping your people succeed, that's something now that's top of mind for me. So if you are planning an affiliate launch yourself and you're listening to this and you're thinking, how do I attract better referral partners? Think about your pre launch content. Like Laura just said, that might, that might help you stand out to them a little bit more. Okay. Yes. Oh, wait, I'll just say one thing that really per put, puts me over the edge where I'm like, yes, um, is when they say, and got to be truthful about this. If you've tested it and said like this pre-launch content converts so well, uh, mm -hmm. if you, if you've got figures that make me say, okay, then it's a home run just to send them to this and I won't have to work that hard. Um, then I am a yes. This is why I like you, Laura, because <laughs> you can nerd out over data like me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I am the same way. If someone has like proven conversion rates, I'm like, all right, it's plug and play. What's there to lose? So um, I love that. Okay. My final add-on question to this case study, and then we'll uh, wrap up with what's next, what's exciting for you in this season of your business. I know that you know this case study in particular was focused on you know how you did so well how you became the number one affiliate partner when you had a smaller list of 6000 but your most successful affiliate launch ever was when you affiliated for Amy Porterfield's um 
DCA program, right? And and yeah. thank you for your transparency and sharing that you made almost two hundred thousand dollars in commission from that launch. I love talking to women like you who aren't afraid to talk about money and and put that on the table. <laughs> so I'm just curious, uh, maybe if you could share with us a wh- what size your list was at that point for that particular launch with Amy. And also, is there anything else outside of list size that you felt was different from that launch versus when you um, were an affiliate for Impacting Millions that made that your most successful launch? Yeah. um, I think a lot of things, a lot of different factors aligned in that year. So that was 2020. Uh, and if you ever hear, you've heard me say this, Ellen, if you ever hear somebody say like, I made X amount, you know, from this, even during the pandemic, um, that is, if they're talking about an online course, well, then they should, they should make, have made that much in 2020 because 2020 was a gold rush and things are still great. And the, you know, online courses are doing really well, but I don't know if anything will ever top 2020. I think it's just, you know, everybody was home and they were like, what now? And a lot of these courses were about, you know, showing you how to create a new career for yourself, a new side hustle, a new pivot when, you know, people couldn't go to work or laid off, et cetera. So, um, so that's one thing that came into play. Uh, I had, I think my list was at around 20,000 maybe, um, it, it is not that much bigger now than it was then. If it, it might have stayed about the same size um, in between, like I've gotten a lot of new people, but I, I've also lost a lot because I've been scrubbing my list continually since then. So it's like a little bit of a break even point. So anyway, um, that was the size of my list. I had gotten a big bump. My list had just practically doubled from like a couple of years before. Um, part of that was from the copy cure. I got a huge bump from that. That is my program with Marie Forleo. Marie Forleo had launched her book, which was a instant number one New York Times bestseller. um, And she launched it in a big way. So that brought a lot of people to her, which brought a lot of people to me. So that was one factor that made it really successful from my end. I think it was the first year also, first or second year, but like big year for Amy um, doing DCA. She had previously sold two separate courses. One was webinars that convert and the other was courses that convert. And this was the, I think the first or second time she combined them. And so it was big news. It was a big offer. Um, and she was all, she's always all in on her launches, but there was just a lot of energy for that launch. And, um, I don't, I don't know. I had great bonuses. Uh, I had, I, one of my bonuses was a course that had not yet launched. So that also gave me an edge. And I still offered that as a bonus for DCA. It's called launch hero. And that was the, that's a perfect layup for DCA. This like this launch hero is going to teach you how to do an all email launch or support your launch with emails. Um, when you, when your course is ready to launch. So perfect match. And, um, I had other bonuses, which I continue to have, but I I forget what, but it was just like a lot of energy from all sides on that, on that launch. Thank you. Thank you for breaking that down and for your honesty and, you know, attributing a part of that success to, you know, worldwide circumstances that were perhaps outside of all of our control. And so I appreciate that honesty and I have, learned so much just soaking in your wisdom. You know, it's all I'm always honored to learn from the best of the best when it comes to any craft. And you certainly, you know, won in in the in the in the world of writing. And speaking of, you know, going back to the very beginning when you said, you know, I want to be known as Laura Freaking Bell Gray, the writer, uh, we can't end this episode without you talking about Tough Titties, your first, your first yeah. book. So when does that come out? What is it about? Where can people buy and read it? Thank you for asking. It comes out June 13th, 2023. And I just got word from my agent that the galleys are in. That's the, you know, the soft, the soft cover that goes out to, you know, that you send to authors for blurbs and 
advanced readers um, that she just, they arrived at the office. So and she says it looks fabulous. So I'm really excited. Um, and it is a New York flavored memoir and essays about, you know, growing up, making mistakes, um, being like making poor romantic choices, being unsuited for corporate life. And uh, my husband, who hasn't read it yet, refers to it as loser sex in the city. <laughs> Can that go on the inside book jacket? <laughs> Yes, I think it might. It, I, I did put it on the on the Hachette page, on the publisher's page. And it's on the Amazon copy. So. <laughs> Amazing. So June, June, and we can pre-order starting in the spring, I'm assuming? You can pre-order right now oh, wow. while okay. you're, as you're listening to this. It has, uh, you know, I don't know when this is airing, um, but we're talking right now in November and it has been low key up on their site and on Amazon for several weeks now, but I'm not supposed to, you know, really pump that until I'm not sure when. Um, so I'm probably, as you're listening to this, I'm probably still not going gung ho, like pre-order now, pre-order now, because you lose your momentum. You know, you don't want to start saying that so far, like six months out, but pre-order now. Yeah, but you guys, you guys, you guys got it on the DL though. So check below in the show notes. We'll put a link to pre-order Tough Titties. I am beyond excited to read this. I just feel like in in a sea of you know business related books, I love a good memoir. There's something about you know just true storytelling that that can't be beat. And I know that your uh, your book is is going to just make me laugh hysterically. So <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I couldn't bear to do a business book. I know that's the book that I'm supposed to do. We're all supposed to do our business book that, you know, um, with like a quiz or a link in the back that leads people to our site, etc. And that's not the book I wanted to write. So I may be stupid, but I'm happy about it. It's never stupid because it's what makes you you. So Laura, uh, to wrap up our time together today, what does being a CEO mean to you? <laughs> I'm laughing because I never wanted to be a CEO. I so, love it. <laughs> if that's your answer, that's your answer. <laughs> yeah, I think it means being something that I'm never capable of being, which is like ha having nice nails, having all your shit together, being in charge of your company. And really, I hired like my manager, Sandra. I've told her from the very beginning, I need you to be my boss. So I'm not CEO material and I don't think I ever will be, but that is okay. I'm like, do it my own way. Unsupposed to kind of person. Well, that's the power of knowing who you are right at your core. Laura, thank you. It's one of many things I appreciate about you. Make sure once again, to look in the show notes, to follow Laura on social, check out Talking Shrimp, her website, her offers, and of course, pre-order Tough Titties. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much, Ellen. Do I, should I give them a gift or do you want to just end it there? You know what? Uh, if you have a gift for our listeners, I know they would be more than happy to take your gift. So Laura, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, share your gift. I absolutely do. Okay, so I have two things in one and it's going to be just for you guys. Um, one is my mini course, free mini course, uh, which is called Story Gold Mine, And it is 63 unexpected ways to mine your everyday life for stories that you can use in your emails and your content so that you can stay regular and keep top of mind uh, for your subscribers, which is really important leading up to a launch. And the other is my guide to non-sucky subject lines. It's my 33 most open subject lines and for that tanked and why, um, so that yours don't have to. But these are both going to help you crush it with an email launch or your everyday broadcast emails that I hope that you're sending. So you're going to find that in the show notes, but you can go to talkingshrimp.com slash CEO. Thank you, Laura. Oh my gosh. I'm running to the link myself right now. All of you who have ever said, my life is too boring. I have nothing to write, nothing to say. You got to, you don't have no excuse anymore. Laura's literally telling you how to mine your life for those golden stories. So Laura, thank you so much for your generous gift. And thank you again for joining us as a guest today. Thank you, Ellen. I loved it. <laughs>